oppression and religion don't sleep on the same bed. But isn't that, if I may say so, and I hope I'm not offending people here, let me just say what I would have said if we'd had more time up there. Um, I have a deep sympathy for the Jewish people. I, and I think as Christians we owe them a deep apology for the incredible suffering that we've caused them over the centuries. And that would apply also to Islam. Um, I think that what they have gone through, and not least in the latter years under the uh, Nazi Holocaust, I think is absolutely appalling. And the world did not help and uh, went through noises and so on, but did not take the people in, even at the end of it all. So the modern state of Israel is almost a survival mechanism. I can understand why people who have been rejected by the world and treated like that should want a place of their own. Where I have a problem, though, is when Christians use the Bible to say that what's happening in Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. Because if one, when I was in Israel, what I found was a largely secular state. I mean, there's some very orthodox Jews, but the state functions almost, in many cases, without, with, without belief. And when you look at the way it operates vis-à-vis -vis the Palestinians, you have to say it's founded on injustice and unrighteousness and cruelty. When I was in Israel, I, a Palestinian man said to me, I can understand why the Jews need to find a land of their own. What I can't understand is, after all their sufferings, why they cause us now to suffer in the same way. Now, if you're going to call that the fulfillment of prophecy, it has to be founded on righteousness. In fact, it's interesting, I came across one of the more fundamental Christian books that was saying this is a fulfillment of prophecy and quoted a passage from Jeremiah. Significantly, he left out the preface that says, if you return to me, this will happen. All he said was that the people would be gathered together. He quoted another passage from Isaiah chapter 10, which is all about the remnant. But the remnant is a righteous remnant. So I don't see how Israel as it stands, can be a fulfillment of prophets. The prophets would say, if you go that way, you're going to lose the land, not gain it. And the sadness for me is that Christians are using the Bible in such a way that they support what's going on in the face of Palestinians, some of whom are their Christian brothers, as well as, of course, Muslims. And I think that, that itself is unjust. I hope that doesn't tread on too many corns, but <laughs> I actually believe one has to say that. And it's why I couldn't see it as a sign of the end. Well, the Quran... Molina, sorry. Um, if we can end this session with your answering or discussing that last point. Okay. The Quran, I'll just take a minute. The Quran supports you. Yes, it does. In the 21st chapter entitled the prophets the Quran declares only my servants who are righteous in conduct will inherit this land only those and uh, righteousness in conduct and oppression are worlds apart from each other mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much obviously uh, I didn't need uh, any ending to it. I mean, you've obviously uh, agree that that was a very uh, thought-provoking, very challenging uh, discussion, and uh, clearly it had it, um, generated, obviously, many questions. I am not going to take up time or discussing or asking questions. I'll leave it to you. The floor is now open. Thank you. Bishop Well, if I answer the question that way, let me just say what I think is the issue we've got to grapple with in terms of the future. Because I think that if what one is saying about prophets, that if you respond to God, it can go one way. If you don't respond to God, it can go another way. I think the challenge that we've been faced with as Christians, Muslims, Jews, of all religious faith communities, is how do we create a world in which people start to behave as human beings to each other? How do we live 
in a world... I mean, we speak of Christ as the Prince of Peace. There is uh, Richard Dawkins, this famous uh, um, geneticist who's now become a militant atheist, uh, has written this book, The God Delusion. And it's very easy to write that off, but he's making some very important points. He's actually saying, I would like to see the end of all religion because religion has been responsible for so much violence and cruelty in our world. Now, that's an indictment on all of us. And I think insofar as it is, one of the things that we should be grappling with is how do we so learn to reach across each to each other that we can pick up what I would call human values. And those human values are there in our culture, they're there in our faith, they're there in our Bibles. But it seems to me that we only find that when we begin not to look at where we differ in our understanding but when we begin to reach out, as I think we are doing tonight, mm -hmm. as human beings, one with another, coming from very different angles, and yet we can laugh and smile and <laughs> share together and learn from one another. Now, that's got to be the world we're moving in. So it doesn't seem to me it's a question of when did Muslims create violence like that. It's, the problem is that we all are capable of it, and we have all have a history of it. And what we need to do is to say, well, that's the challenge. How do we actually move into another future? And maybe we can save the world <laughs> in a strange way. Does it have to be a catastrophe that says the end of the world is coming? I think one needs a much more crisis. God, we, uh, uh, our biblical tradition, which is common to both of us, I think, arising from Abraham, is that God is a God of history. And that means God is working his purpose out in history. Does that mean, therefore, that if, if history has to end in an utter disaster, has God been God? Has Lord been Lord? Uh, and I think that when his people respond to him, then God can work his purpose out. And we can pray for the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, to come into this world. That's the challenge I think we're facing. Um, no. Um, because I think that our understanding is that when Christ returns again, he will return in glory. And that that will wind all things up and bring to completion all things. See, I think that the understanding of Christ ruling in history is this thing that comes out of what we call the millennium teaching. But I think Christ is already ruling in history if we will only listen to him and obey him. Um, it's, uh, the scriptures talk about Christ reigning until um, he had put all his enemies under his feet and then he hands over the authority to God. So I don't see Christ. It does not say when he comes again he will come uh, to walk among us. It says he will come in glory uh, and wonder. So I think that may be a difference that we have in our understandings. Uh, the prophet... Allah's blessings be upon him said uh, that when Jesus returns alayhi salam uh, apart from ruling the world with justice that he would share money not South African rands <laughs> and most certainly not the US dollar the money would be the original money created by God, the dinar and dirham in the gold and silver coins. But that's another story. He said he would get married. I don't think he'll be a South African girl. <laughs> he said that he'd get married. He said that he'd have children. He would live for 40 years then he would die and he would then when he dies you would pray over his body and he would then be buried next to me. After giving that lecture I got an email. Sheikh Imran where did you get that information that Jesus is going to be buried next to you? <laughs> Prophet is buried in Medina. 
And so here there's a, here's a prophecy, concrete, flesh and blood, concrete prophecy. That when he returns, he's going to return in person in flesh and blood because he's going to get married and have children. And he would die and he'd be buried in Medina. I just wanted to end that into the record. Like I said at the very beginning of this thing, it's a big subject and there's a lot of complex issues. And one of them is the movement from what was called prophecy to apocalyptic. Now the difference between the prophets, one was a sequence following the other, but where the prophets spoke of this world and tended to be very optimistic about God's purposes in this world, the apocalypse, apocalyptic person had despaired of this world. And it's amazing how much of our, our imagery about the end of the world comes from apocalyptic writing, which means it's focusing very much on the bad things, the negatives, the, the anti-Christ, you see, the, the, the things that are wrong. I think that, you know, that righteousness and goodness and truth um, is the thing that is dominant in, in certainly the New Testament. Um, three things abide, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now, if one lives a world in a world in which what we call the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, goodness, peace, gentleness, kindness, patience, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, as against the seven deadly sins of greed and covetousness and anger and all the others, lust, you see, it, the righteousness comes when we walk God's way. And it, it seems to me that the real focus, certainly from a Christian point of view, is one of so being open to God that he fills you with his spirit so that you can walk in his way. It's not trying to live a good life. It's letting God be the one to whom you're open, in which you're seeking to obey him, seeking to walk his way. If I understand Islam rightly, it's the whole conquest of the self. And I think that that is right. You cannot deal with the external enemy unless you've dealt with the real enemy, which is the one on the inside. And I think that, therefore, righteousness is... When we're focusing on things of righteousness, we do better to look at those things, goodness, truth, love, and so on, rather than always be focusing on the negative. And the problem that we have with this debate, really, is... It, it tends to be the focus on what's going wrong rather than what's going right. I use up all the time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I have four minutes as well. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I just love that, that last part of the answer. We still have Christian mystics around in the world today. But I love the question even more. When the poor are permanently poor and the rich are permanently rich that's not righteousness no. that's oppression and that oppression is around the world today if you have a black African woman working in your home as a domestic servant and you pay her a wage that no one in your social circle will ever work for you work her you pay her the wage of a dog that's not righteousness. But righteousness is that you don't wait for government to redistribute wealth. No. That you go out yourself. You marry her. You have children with her. And when you have, when you marry her, you don't take her out of the slum and bring her to live in a palace. But you go and live in the sun with her. And your children will grow up there. And then you will use your wife and your mother-in-law to reach out to all the poor. Remember, in poverty the woman suffers more than the man. And you reach out to all the poor of your wealth. Instead of buying a Mercedes or your second or your third, you'll save and economize. And you will make an effort to take the poor out of permanent poverty so that when the bloodshed 
starts, they will protect you because they know they can recognize righteous conduct. Well, if I can ask you, you know, in the context of the end times, um, the Antichrist, the concept of the Antichrist has come up in your discourse and, of course, in Bishop Kuhn's as well. But um, from the two uh, positions, I get the impression that there's one view is that the Antichrist, the Dajjal, the Antichrist is a concept, is a system, is, is, is a, a whole system and not an individual a being or thing. Whereas I get the impression from you, your uh, discourse, your discussion, that it's actually an entity, a, a single individual entity. Uh, could you um, elaborate on that? Please? That would take us to cosmology, the cosmology with which you started. Perhaps the most difficult of all is not the flying donkey. No. The Prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him, that when the Jal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year. There's your cosmology. One day like a month. One day like a week. And all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like your days. When his day is like your day, he would be in your dimension of time. But prior to that, he is released. There are angels here, apart from your wife, of course. There are <laughs> angels here. But we can't see them. In addition to the angels, there are beings created of fire, smokeless fire. This is sacred language called the jinn. And they're here, but we can't see them. They are in another world of space and time. So when the Antichrist is released, he would be in three different worlds of space and time, three different stages of his mission, where a cosmological presence impacts upon politics and economics. Hmm? until finally when his mission is almost totally complete only then would he appear and the prophet said والسلام, that he would be born of Jewish parents he would be a Jew now when I had the last Christian Muslim dialogue in Trinidad as a young man he told me that in Christian thought the Antichrist is Gentile whereas our prophet said He'd be a Jew, born of Jewish parents. Uh, he'll be young and powerfully built. He'll have curly hair. Um, but although he appears as a human being, he would not be a human being. Because he would not be subject to judgment on the last day and be rewarded with heaven or punished with hell. Mm? He would appear as a human being. So there is a most definite cosmopolit uh, cosmological. cosmological dimension to the understanding of the subject of the Antichrist. My book, Jerusalem in the Quran, I've attempted to, to grapple with that cosmological problem and to show the linkage between cosmology and politics, cosmology and economics, and in particular cosmology and international monetary economics. Thank you. Yeah, I find that, to be honest, I find that quite difficult to understand. Um, because, you see, when I'm thinking of cosmology, I'm talking about a universe that's been in existence, the latest figures, 14.7 billion years, uh, with uh, uh, you and I in a planet in the Milky Way, which is 80,000 light years across, but is only one galaxy among millions of galaxies, among millions of stars, presumably millions of planets. Now, the, the, when I'm asking the cosmological question, I'm asking what is God's purpose in terms of the universe that's speeding at this kind of, expanding at enormous rate still, creating new stars and so on. It's almost as though so much of our thinking is Earth-centered, almost. 
in a cosmological world that makes us almost a speck of dust. Now, I, I know before God we're very important and that we are precious in his sight, but where is the purpose of God within the universal thing and not just in a planet? And, uh, you know, when you explain it the way you do it, I don't think it, it doesn't ring with me, but that, I mean, we're, I'm going to have to invite you for a cup of masala chai. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question, a written one, um, to the bishop, to Bishop uh, Quinlan. Um, you mentioned the problem with the book, the word, uh, in describing something. I can read it directly, as it is here. In academia, academic uh, circles, scholars require theory, frameworks, the book, to guide and inform practice and experience. Practice and experience then make sense at the theoretical level or builds on and improves the theory. Question. Shouldn't the book therefore be seen as a guiding your interpretation in religious matters? Sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. May I look at I'll read it? I'll myself. repeat. I'll repeat. Um, or maybe yes, yes, I think it's best if you read it through it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is the book here being referred to the Bible or the Quran? I assume it's the Bible that okay. is referred to. Um, yeah, the question really is what do it? Yeah, the question that it shouldn't the book, the Bible, therefore be the guide to your interpretation of religious matters? Uh, I think it is. I think that where, that's why I say I live, personally, I live out of the scriptures. Um, but I, I understand nevertheless that the, if I'm going to understand them fully, that for me, I would say that Christ is the hermeneutical key. In other words, he is the one that unlocks the meaning for me. For example, what do I make of all the violence in the Old Testament? How do I interpret that? In Christian terms, I have to say, well, that's not the way Christ is. I mean, if I want to be really controversial, I don't want to get into this one, but let me really throw the cat among the pigeons. We, the, our, my church is being divided at the moment over the whole issue of homosexuality. And actually, I think that debate is not about homosexuality, it's about the Bible. It's about, do we interpret the Bible as it is or do we have another basis of interpretation? And I think that, that some of us would say that the real key is not to ignore the scriptures, not at all, but you have to wrestle with them in the light of the person that we see in, the, in Christ. And Christ is the one who deals with the marginalized, he deals with those who are uh, on the edge of things, he, he loves, he deals with the poor, the needy. Uh, and, and so... I haven't answered the question, I'm not going to try to, but I am, what I'm trying to illustrate is that, yes, the Bible's crucial, and we do listen to it in the spirit, but when the chips are down, you listen to it through what you understand to be Christ by his spirit. Now, I hope that makes sense. It doesn't make me a fundamentalist. Sorry, uh, I just want to uh, use again my lyricist chair. <laughs> am I understanding correctly, then, the... Bible then, is it merely a point of reference and did you use your own interpretation? I, I no, no you, um, no, you don't use it. You see, there are other criteria too. The way in which the church has always interpreted scripture is also our guideline. You see, you start with the text, you're asking questions about how it was written, what it meant originally, and then you're asking questions what it means to us. We believe ourselves to be led into all truth by the spirit that's at work in us, but we test that spirit by the way the church has interpreted those scriptures all down the ages. So if I go come up with some interpretation that's contrary to the way the whole tradition of the church has interpreted it, then I'm more, li more likely to be wrong than the church, if you understand that. Thank you. But the modern versions are just different translations of the same text as it's come to us. Um, so it's, there's no possibility that we'll end up with another Bible what we might end up with maybe more translations but it does raise a question because as I understand it that's one of the dilemmas that 
uh, Islam works with. You, you work always with the Arabic, I think. Can I just ask Thank you another you. thing? Oh, on the same subject. Oh, please. Um, for example, the King James Version has the Trinity in it. And the Old Testament doesn't have the Trinity in it. Is that the same version? or Has the what in it? The Trinity. Mentioning of the Trinity. The, uh, the, Trinity. the, the King James Version, none of the Bibles has any mention of the Trinity as such. Um, they, they refer to Father, Son and Holy Spirit. There are many passages, but the Trinity as such is a doctrine that has tried to give expression to experience. And that experience is reflected in the New Testament and is referenced, many, many references to it. But you won't find any reference to the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible at all. I do want to respond to a comment that uh, I don't see the utility of a dialogue on the signs of the last day. If events are unfolding in the world, if women are dressing like men, that's important, isn't it? Why is it happening? If women are dressed and yet naked, is it happening? If it is, well, that's important. What is the explanation? If there is now a growing preference for sexual intercourse in public rather than private, is it happening? If it is, is it happening by accident? Or is there an explanation? The subject we have addressed tonight is important because it offers an explanation at least an explanation from our perspective if there are other explanations bring them to the table if these events are happening by accident that I have mentioned earlier then I, I told you can go back home and tell your wife the, ju the cow jumped over the moon If they're not happening by accident, then there must be an explanation. If we grasp that explanation, we'll be able to anticipate what is to come. And we'll then be better be able to respond to a world which is changing so rapidly and in a manner which creates such problems for us. So this is certainly a very important exercise in which we engage tonight. The historical process is one in which there has always been a contest between truth and falsehood and therefore between righteous conduct and wickedness. We must have eyes with which to see and not be deceived to be able to recognize righteousness as righteousness and recognize wickedness as wickedness. So we do not see the unfolding events in the world today in an entirely negative light. There is a perspective in which there is a great examination going on. And the Lord above, the God of Abraham, is testing us. How many are they who would struggle to preserve internal integrity and preserve righteous conduct when all the world is falling apart. Now that is a very important struggle. We do not simply say, well, things are falling apart, we lose hope for the world, when in fact, you should be standing up as Nelson Mandela did so wonderfully to hold on to integrity, to hold on to righteousness. Well, what can I do in South Africa as these signs are unfolding in the world? Is it scripted that I can do nothing? I said, you have a, an African woman working as a domestic maid. 
and, and she's paid the salary of maybe a dog or a slave. Suppose that is the case. You would never allow your daughter to work for that salary. No, nobody from your community would work for that salary. You could do something about that. In doing something about that that the government perhaps may not be able to do, you are setting an example. You're making an effort to change the world. Even if you don't change the world, you leave the world with light in your heart that you've made an effort to change the world. Thank you, Bishop. You would like to... Well, yes, I, I would go a little further and say, uh, as I have done, I think that there is nothing predetermined. I would be very worried if we were really to say, well, look, because there are things written that it must go that way. Um, I believe that, it, that the real insight into what's happening at the moment is telling us there's a conflict between good and evil going on. There are issues of truth and the lie. Uh, and there's a, a, a real call, I think, for God's people to begin to take him seriously enough to be obedient and to walk his way. If we do, we change the world. That is hope. Um, and I think that, that um, as I tried to say in my initial presentation, I think we face days of the Lord. I think we face moments where it's quite critical how we behave and how we act. If we act in one way, things will change. If we do not, they'll go another. And I think that those of us who lived in South Africa saw that miracle, not only through enormous amount of prayer, amazing cooperation, by the way, between the different faith communities, but gradually a build-up of resistance in saying enough is enough, and even to die for what you believed, that we may have justice. And the amazing thing is we found a kind of newness. Now, what we're facing is another local crisis. Uh, if we lose sight of the things that we struggled for, and the next government does what so many governments do do, and then become victims of the very thing they were fighting against, then we go down the drain again. And at some point, we always have to be ready to say, so far and no further. Now, that's hope. That's what God's people are called to do. And if we go that way, then always the world is full of hope. I actually believe that Christians are prisoners of hope. And I suppose that's true of all faith communities, because God is our source of our life and our end. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a, uh, a lady at the back. Yes.